Good morning. I'm Jill, and I'm at Ladies Craft Night. Our mission is to go make disciples. We'll be taking our Thanksgiving offering this morning, and that goes to missions. We uh, like to spread the word of God around the world, and your offering will help in doing that and winning lives for Christ. After service today, we will be gathering across the parking lot in our fellowship hall for our Thanksgiving dinner. Please come on over and join us. Well, there are no Wednesday night service this week, and we want you to all enjoy your Thanksgiving with your family. That's all of our announcements. Check your bulletin for more upcoming events. Everyone needs compassion.
have believed in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to bow your, your heads with me as we come before the Lord in prayer. Today we will lean on the psalmist to guide our prayer. From Psalm 16. Lord, you alone are our portion and our cup. You make our lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for us in pleasant places. Surely we have a delightful inheritance. And so we praise you, Lord God, you who counsel us, you who counsel us. Even at night, our heart instructs us. We keep our eyes always on you, our Lord, for with you at our right hand, we will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will also rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life, you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Father, that is our prayer. It is a prayer of hope. It is a prayer of joy. It is a prayer of thanksgiving. And we thank you, Lord, that we can pray this prayer because of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is our mission to go make disciples of you. And I pray for our missionaries, for Bruce and Cinda McKellips, as they uh, serve in Portugal, in the mission there in Europe. Be with them, use them. May they see fruit for their labor. May they win the loss to you. And we pray for our local mission, right here in Battle Creek, use us. May we be a people who shine, who smile, who are exuberant and joyful because of the resurrection. And Lord God, we pray especially for those in our community who are sick, ill, who come to church today weary and heavy laden. We think especially of Dorothy Philo. She has a number of health concerns, and uh, it seems like the time might be near. We pray, Lord God, that even now in this moment, she would know that she is loved by you. She is loved by her family and by her church. May you flood her with an assurance of your love. Lord, we pray for all of those who came today with burdens that they could not express. Lift up their hearts today. Help them to see their situation in a new way. Give them hope. Give them joy. Lord, we pray this in your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I was in a little bit late today. I slept in. <laughs> I'm kidding. 
No, that's not it. I didn't just sleep in this morning. I was over at Hope Church preaching over there, and uh, it was a good day for me to, to meet, for me to preach at Hope. Uh, Pastor Will and I have already had it scheduled, but he's he's a sick little puppy today. I mean, the poor guy can't barely talk. So uh, he, he eats out as much as he could in reading of scripture for his congregation, but uh, it was a good thing. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's crazy. When times like that happen, it's like, we didn't know, but the Lord knew. Amen? Uh, God is good, and He just knows what we need, when we need it, when we don't. And, uh, and so uh, it's very good. I, I, I wonder if part of it's because of, of yesterday. See, he went, to, he went to some stadium somewhere in the state of Michigan to see some football team play. Uh, I think they're called the Wolverines. Have you heard of them? Uh, Anyways, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This, I know, that's my friend. See, you know, this week, okay, I'm getting way off topic here. I need to stay focused, but just bear with me for a moment. This weekend is going to be huge, folks. This is going to be a good weekend, so have fun with it. I need it. I'm a Buckeye fan. Y'all know that. You know, many of you are Michigan fans. It's all good, because we're, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Right? I mean, it's, it's just fun. It's just football. You know, so just have fun with it. Enjoy the game. Please, you know, don't get all angry and mad about stuff. I'm a little worried this year. The Buckeyes, I mean, we've been eating out wins, but it has not been pretty. So Michigan, yikes. We'll see what we have in store. Move on. All right, move on. What gives you courage? <laughs> yes, we're moving on. What gives you courage? Think about that. What enables you? What empowers you? What emboldens you to live the life that you are called to live? The answer for us as the church is the resurrection. That is our answer. What gives you the assurance to take that next step in your life, that step into the unknown, into the future, into that which is scary. What gives you the assurance to do that? The answer for the church? The resurrection. What gives you hope? That no matter who or what has wounded you, what gives you hope that there can be healing and wholeness on the other side of that? What gives you hope that even though life has broken you, God can mend you? What gives you hope for that? The answer is the resurrection. You see, life will throw us questions our way. Questions like, what if I fall? What if I stumble? What if I fail? What if we don't make it? Whoever we might be. When, 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 when life gives us these questions, how do we respond? What is our answer to those questions? The answer is the resurrection. The resurrection tells us that if we fall, God will pick us up. The resurrection tells us that if we fail, that is not the end. The resurrection tells us that no matter what gets thrown our way, God will have the final say. Amen. The resurrection is God's answer to all the questions of this fallen world, and it can, and it should be your answer as well. To the question of sin, God's response is resurrection. To the question of death, God's response is resurrection. To the questions of despair, hopelessness, woundedness, and all the others, God's answer to it all is resurrection. And so, this is our goal, to inherit the resurrection that Christ has inherited on Easter. Yes, that is our goal. Jesus' victory over sin and death can be ours as well. So what is resurrection? Resurrection is life after death. Resurrection is the defeat of the powers of sin and evil. Resurrection 
Resurrection is God's kingdom come. Resurrection is God's will finally done. It is the end of all death and destruction. Resurrection is the restoration of all creation. And by that I don't just mean our bodies. I mean all creation. The whole universe. Restoration of it all. That is resurrection. It is physical and it is spiritual. It is physical and spiritual. Just as physical as we are in this world, but yet animated by the Spirit of God. It is physical and spiritual, not either or, both and. That's crucial to understand. The resurrection is not spirit void of physicality. The resurrection is physical infused by the Holy Spirit of God. And so the resurrection can be touched. Put your hands in the nail markings. Put it into my side. See, the resurrection can be touched. The resurrection can be seen. My friends, the resurrection is why I stand before you today in hope. And the resurrection is what emboldened, empowered, enabled the early Christians to do what God had called them to do. I think of the Apostle Paul as he was lying in that dark dungeon of a prison writing to the Philippians. Listen to the boldness that he has as he says this in Philippians 3, verses 10 through 11. This is what he has to say to the church. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection. But I also want to participate in his sufferings. Because I believe, says Paul, that if I become like Jesus in his death, so also somehow by the grace and mercy and, and power of God, I will also attain to the resurrection from the dead. There it is. When it's all said and done, Paul has courage that even if the Roman Empire were to kill him, he believes that God will have the final say over his body. And God will raise up his lifeless body to inherit eternal life. And so Paul has no fear. He has no fear. But he continues to preach the good news that God is victorious in our world. No matter what the powers might do to him, he has unwavering faith in God. You see, the early church, we're talking first generation of believers. The early church was filled with saints, witnesses, martyrs whose courage and boldness was founded on their sure hope that God has in fact raised Jesus from the dead, and they knew that since God loved them too, God would also raise up their mortal bodies so that they can inherit immortal bodies that will never decay or deteriorate. Hear the words of John the Revelator in Revelation chapter 12. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. This is John speaking to the church. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, here it is. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God. Amen. And the authority of his Messiah, Jesus, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. 
And why did they not shrink from death? Because they knew that this life is not all there is. No matter what the world might inflict upon them, God will respond. And His response is resurrection. The Old Testament prophet Daniel gives a beautiful image of what the resurrection looks like. We find it in Daniel chapter 12. Will you st would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We're in Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Man, you may be seated. Notice what Daniel says here. He says that there will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. You see, Daniel was prophesying the word of the Lord in a time period when the empires of the ancient Near East were battling one another. And unfortunately, Daniel's people, the Israelite people, were a tiny little nation. And unfortunately, they were the, the ones in between these global conquests of these powerful empires. And so unfortunately, Daniel and his people were the collateral damage. And Daniel finds himself exiled with a few of his, of his, of his brethren in Babylon. If you look at Daniel chapter 7, Daniel receives a vision of, of what these empires truly look like in God's eyes. What they truly look like. Um, and, and they're all terrible beasts. Uh, they're all terrible beasts. They, they all overpower their enemy and they kill them. Uh, the, the first, um, and we'll get, to, we'll get to this in a second, Tom, but the first image of an empire that Daniel receives is, is that of a lion with wings like an eagle. And the, the second empire is, is like a bear with, with ribs of flesh in its mouth. It's a ghastly image. The, the third is like a leopard and it's given authority to rule. But, but it's interesting to note that the fourth beast, which Daniel sees a vision of in Daniel chapter 7, is so terrible, it is so horrifying, that Daniel doesn't even describe it as an animal. It's more like a machine. And, and in fact, Daniel says this about this fourth animal, that it had large iron teeth. See? It wasn't even organic. It was an iron. It was a machine. This fourth beast had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. That the point of these visions that, 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 that God is trying to speak through Daniel is that these earthly, man-made empires were destroying the inhabitants of the earth in their pursuit of their, of their, of their quest for power, influence, territory, fame, glory, they, you name it, they wanted it. And they were willing to crush underfoot anyone and anything who would even attempt to get in their way. That's why they're described as lions and leopards and bears and machines. And as we celebrated Veterans Day last week, we were reminded that times of war continue from generation to generation on the face of this earth. 
And remember what I shared with you last week, that Veterans Day, November 11th, stemmed from the end of World War I, which occurred on the 11th hour of the 11th day on the 11th month in 1918, 100 years ago. Remember, World War I very much was like that fourth beast, in that human beings were destroyed by machines. World War I was a devastating war, such that the Earth had never experienced before, because humanity had learned how to make weapons of horrific destruction. Gas that would creep into the trenches. You see, World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. But we know how the rest of the 20th century played out. The 20th century was the most bloody century this world has ever seen. You think warfare in the Old Testament times were bad. The 20th century was the most horrific century that this world has ever witnessed. Well, maybe the 21st century will be better. Maybe. We can hope. I mean, just one year into the 21st century, September 11th occurred. We fought for 10 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. And now that we have completed that, or we're hoping to be done with that, we're looking at Russia, China, North Korea, and it makes you wonder, will war ever stop on the face of this earth? And so when Daniel delivers this vision, he's, he's preaching a word to us, yes, but he's also speaking for us. You see, when, when Daniel receives these visions, he's speaking for the people, and, and he's expressing the people's thoughts of when, oh God, will you deliver us? When, oh Lord, will your reign come on the face of the earth? When will the monsters stop? When will it happen? When will peace reign over the earth? Will peace reign over the earth? And do you know what the answer is? The answer is yes! Peace will reign. God's kingdom will come. Because Daniel says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, we stood for the reading of it, that at that time, your people will be delivered. Amen? God's ultimate weapon to bring peace on earth is the resurrection. The resurrection. Your bulletins, the front of your bulletins, God's ultimate weapon. It is the resurrection. And so while Daniel received a vision of these four terrifying beasts, he also received a vision of a fifth being. And this fifth being was not a terrifying beast with claws and fangs. It did not have iron teeth to kill and destroy. The fifth being that Daniel saw was a humble and simple human being. One like a son of man. And that, my friends, is why Jesus was called the son of man. Because Jesus is the fifth being that Daniel saw. Daniel chapter 7, I want to read this for you, verses 13. This will be on the screen. This is the fifth vision that Daniel had. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was not a lion, not a bear, not a leopard, 
not a machine, but one like a son of man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days, that's God, and was led into God's presence. The Son of Man was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You see, we as the church believe that this vision is the vision of Jesus Christ, who was given authority, glory, and sovereign power at his resurrection on that first Easter Sunday morning. And while the four beasts killed and destroyed, Jesus was killed. Jesus was destroyed on that cross. He was crucified. But God gave a response in the resurrection on the third day. And we believe that one day Jesus will return and all nations and peoples of every language will worship him. No matter what language you speak, my friends, no matter if you speak Russian, or Korean, or Arabic, or Chinese, or English, all people will see that Jesus is the ruler of all the earth. Because Jesus rules over not an earthly kingdom, but the heavenly kingdom. A kingdom that will never be destroyed. The kingdom of God. A kingdom of the resurrection. Here's the point. God has invaded our world. God has invaded our world that has been dominated by sin and death and brought hope. God has invaded this world with the resurrection, and it will never be the same again. We are moving forward to the, full, to the fullness of God's kingdom. And as we are pilgrims moving forward into God's kingdom, we cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Say that with me. Come, Lord Jesus, come. That is our hope. I like how Brian Blount in his book Invasion of the Dead says, The resurrection is God's ultimate weapon. For God to save us, for God to save humanity, God must invade. And God's primary weapon is the resurrection. First, the Lamb's resurrection on that first Easter Sunday morning, and then ours to follow. When Jesus, the resurrected one, returns and ushers in God's kingdom, the resurrected kingdom, we too will inherit eternal life and live eternally in the kingdom of peace, where there is no more sin or death. For the old order of things has passed away. Now the prophet Daniel poetically describes the resurrection as the multitudes who shine like the stars forever and ever. I mean, isn't that just beautiful? Doesn't that just make your heart leap for joy? It's beautiful imagery, but what does that mean? <laughs> We were talking about this in Wednesday night class, and uh, John actually gave a great, great, great. I was trying to figure it out. I said, let's, let's come up with a contemporary illustration of this, and he really helped me out. He said, he said that when, uh, when they look at, uh, in the automotive industry, and maybe if you're in the automotive industry, maybe you've worked in the automotive industry, you know more about this than I would. But, but John said that, that uh, what a factory will do is, is they, will, they will try to create a car that is perfect to the specs of what they want, of what they've engineered and designed it to be. But, you know, going from design to reality takes some time. So they make a few mistakes, make a few mistakes, but, but eventually 
that 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 that, that uh, factory will be able to make a car which is perfectly in line with the specs, the blueprint. Okay. That that car is called the golden unit. The golden unit. And what the factory will do is they will then make every single car in that factory line exactly like that original one. This is the golden unit. We finally got it right. We got it down to specs. We got it exactly as we wanted it to. This is the golden unit. We made a few mistakes before, but this is the one. Now let's make every car in the assembly line exactly like this one. That, my friends, is an excellent analogy of the resurrection. Jesus is the golden unit. And so when you want to know what your hope is for eternal life, you look to Jesus. He is the golden unit. And we will follow in line behind him. Okay? So um, let's, 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 let's use another analogy. And I've used this with you before. Uh, imagine an apple seed. An apple seed is just this black little speck. I mean, there's nothing much to an apple seed, right? Well, let's imagine for a moment you take that apple seed and you dig a hole in the ground, you put that apple seed in the ground, you stomp on it, and there you let it, you leave it there. Now, in, in a way, it dies underground, but but what happens? What comes up from the ground? It, another apple seed? No, an apple tree. And, and Paul uses this analogy in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says that our current physical bodies, these things, are like a simple apple seed. And if we die before Jesus returns, and if we are buried underground, when Jesus returns, our bodies will rise up into the resurrection. And just as an apple seed looks nothing like the tree, so also our resurrected bodies are going to be far superior to what our currently bodies are. Far superior. See? But there's continuity between the two. Right? The apple seed does become the apple tree. And so there will be continuity between the seed and the tree, but they will look remarkably different. Preacher, where do you get all this? 1 Corinthians 15, but also just consider the, the resurrection of Jesus. Like I said, Jesus is the golden unit. Okay? And so if you want to know what your resurrection is going to look like, look to Jesus. What happened to Jesus? Jesus' body is no longer in the tomb. So there's continuity between Jesus' physical body that died and his eternal body. There's continuity, but at the same time, remarkably different, right? Another example. Uh, how many of you like to go camping? Anyone likes to go camping? Yeah, a couple of you. All right, all right, all right. Honey, you want to go camping? Okay. Thought I'd try. <laughs> well, let's imagine you like to go camping. It, if, if, you're, if you're a good camping person, you know, you can pop up that tent pretty quick, can't you, right? You've got it down. You've done it a few times, you can put that tent up, you know, stay in for the weekend or whatever, and then take that tent down, right? That tent was not meant to live in for very long. I mean, there's no heat, there's no indoor plumbing, right? It's just a tent, but it serves its purpose for the time, right? Well, that's like our, our current physical bodies. Our current physical bodies are like tents. They're temporary. They don't last forever. They serve a purpose for a time. But our resurrected bodies are more like a house. A house which is built on a foundation, built out of cement block or brick. or I mean, it's built to last. And it's built to be lived in for a long time. And so, obviously, it's just an analogy. Analogies break down at some point. No house literally lasts forever, but the resurrected body will last forever. It is built to last forever. And so, this, this, uh, this topic of resurrection sometimes seems a little weird, seems a little funny, but 
I want them to know that this is the basics of our Christian faith. I asked Pastor Hannon to make sure that we recited the Apostles' Creed. Because the Apostles' Creed articulates the basics. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, right? And in Jesus Christ, right? God's only Son, our Lord, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, a historical reality. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. Historical reality. He descended to the dead. But on the third day, what happened? He rose again. And he ascended into heaven. Daniel 12 led into the presence of God. He is seated at the, at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic means universal in this sense. The communion of saints, what's the end of it? And I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. So, how can the church believe that bodies are going to rise again to live eternally? I mean, Scripture is very clear that that will happen. Daniel chapter 12. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Remember that Jesus was resurrected bodily. He wasn't just a spirit in heaven. He was a spiritual body. You understand the difference? When Jesus was resurrected, he wasn't just a spirit and his body remained in the tomb. No, his body was resurrected by the Spirit of God. And so Jesus inherited a spiritual body. And just like all the rest of you, I would struggle to believe in any, any notion of a resurrection. I would think that's craziness. Had it not been for the resurrection of Jesus. You see... It is because of the resurrection of Jesus that I believe in a universal resurrection of the dead. Remember that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospel writers, all wrote varying accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus. But in one of the areas where they are completely clear, crystal clear, agree 100%, no wavering whatsoever is the empty tomb was empty because God raised Jesus from the dead. Now Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wanted to make sure in all of their various ways of putting the story of Jesus, they wanted that to be clear. <laughs> if there's one thing you need to know about Jesus, it's that his tomb is empty because God raised him from the dead. Amen? All right. Um, one other thing. Those same gospel writers and the early church, the first generation of folks, folks like Peter, you know, they went to their deaths because of this. They went to their deaths because of this. And I don't believe that they would have been willing to die for a lie. You don't die for a lie. You just don't do it. And all of these Christians died because they saw it. And they knew it happened. But you might still be thinking, come on, that's, that's crazy. This resurrection of physical bodies? I mean, I thought that Christianity was all about a good spiritual God and making sure that we're good people, right? But preacher, you're talking about God recreating the whole universe. Like, that's, that's a little much for me to take. <laughs> and I, I sympathize with you. I completely do. And I'm glad that you're seeing the step of faith that Christianity is calling us to. But I take confidence in the new creation because I look around at what God has already created all around us. I mean, consider the fact that our planet Earth is situated at a perfect distance from the sun. And consider the fact that our Earth has a moon of perfect size, a perfect distance from the Earth, which orbits around the Earth. And consider that we have an atmosphere which protects the Earth. 
And we have an ecosystem that allows life to flourish. You do realize that you sitting here would be considered a mathematical impossibility if you weren't here with me today. You do realize that. And so, since I believe in God the Father who created it all, I also believe in God the Father who will recreate it all. See? But another question, and then, and then I'll move on. If, if all of these bodies are going to be resurrected, then where are they going to go? What, what, what are they going to do, right? And you start asking these very uh, tangible questions. If we're going to talk about a physical resurrection, then where do all these bodies fit? I mean, what are you going to do? Again, I, I appeal to Jesus' resurrection because he is the golden unit. And, and I look at how Jesus, it, it, is, it appears that looking at the gospel accounts, it appears that the resurrected Jesus is outside of space and time. You know what I mean? And he can kind of dip in and leave as he wish. It, it, the disciples in the upper room, all of a sudden Jesus appears and then he's gone. Uh, Cleopas and another fellow disciple on the road to Emmaus, all of a sudden Jesus is there, he, Jesus breaks bread with them, and then he's gone. And so when, when God brings the full resurrection, I believe constructs of space and time that we're limited by, uh, we're not going to be limited by that anymore. We're going to be living in eternity. And so these good questions that we kind of wrestle with, they, they, they are betraying the fact that we're we're just simple human beings. And what I'm saying to you is God is greater than all of that. Alright. So how do we inherit the resurrection? Well, Paul puts it his way when he says, I want to share, I want to participate in the sufferings of Christ so that I might also um, inherit the resurrection of Christ. Paul puts it that way. Daniel puts it this way. He says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like stars forever and ever. And so, what we're called to do as we wait for the Lord to come is to be a people who are wise and lead others unto wisdom. What does it mean to be wise? It means to be able to look at the destination and say, because I want to go there, we need to take this path. A wise person says, I want to go here, and so I'm going to take this path. Or, no, no, I, I, we need to go there, and so we're going to take this path. You see how a wise person can see the destination, and because of that destination, makes decisions now to meet that destination? That's called wisdom, right? And so, we are called to see that destination of the resurrection, and live our lives now in light of that truth. And so it means that we live our lives in freedom. We don't have to fear or worry about death, either our own or those of our loved ones, because we believe that Jesus has conquered death, and so will we. This means that we are free to live as God has called us to live, while the powers of evil wield the threat of death over others in order to get them to comply, we have our hope in God who resurrects the dead. We know that if someone kills the body, they have no more power over us, but we rely on God, the one who has power over all of our being and has the ultimate authority over us. And so today there is freedom for those who believe in the resurrection to follow the call of God wherever that may lead. And so the, the wise live their lives in freedom. The wise also live their lives on mission. On mission. The Apostle Paul discusses the resurrection at length in 1 Corinthians 15. And at the end, he concludes it by saying this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Since we know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain, we give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, 
And what is this work? It is to go make disciples. For all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. That, my friends, is what resurrection means for us today. Um, I was over at Hope this morning, and uh, I smelled good food. And so I went down into the basement to see where this good food was coming from. If you know anything about me, you know that where good food is, you'll probably find Pastor Ryan. Um, and for that reason, I'm very excited about going into the gymnasium this afternoon. I hope that you all will join us uh, for a wonderful Thanksgiving meal. It's going to be good. Uh, it's going to be really good. We know how to make a, a good spread, so I invite you all to join us. But anyway, so I was down in the basement there checking out what uh, Hope Church was doing for their Thanksgiving meal. And uh, one of the preachers said to me, he said, oh, hey, preacher, I didn't know you joined the army. Uh, you know, he saw Facebook. And I said, yeah, I, uh, I joined as a chaplain candidate. Um, remember, the chaplain candidate program is, is, is met, met for someone like me who's a pastor and is exploring what army chaplaincy is like. Um, an army chaplain can serve either full-time active duty or reserves, part-time, one week in a month. And, and so that's what I've been doing. I've been exploring this call to, to army chaplaincy just in the reserves one week in a month. And thankfully, it's been going well so far. I haven't had to miss a single Sunday yet. I'm glad about that. But you know, I have to be honest with you, I, I've, I've considered this for many years. I mean, since I was young, like a teenager, I've considered chaplaincy in the army. But you know, there was one thing holding me back. The one thing that, I, I, anytime I think about it, I'd say no. You know what that one thing was? I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to think about what that one thing is. I was worried that if I were to go into that, I might get shipped off to war and die. And so I would always pause. But as I have grown in my faith, and as I have matured with the Lord, and as I have studied God's Word, and as I have learned more and more about what the resurrection is, my fear of death is gone. And it has enabled me, empowered me, emboldened me to explore something that I was fearful of exploring before. Now, as a chaplain candidate, I might choose to separate from the Army for any number of reasons. I can do that as a candidate if I decide this is not the direction I want to go. But I'll tell you this much. One reason that will not be there will be fear. That will not be a reason why I choose to stop. You see, the resurrection is the beautiful hope that God's got you back. The resurrection is the beautiful hope that no matter what may happen to you, God will always have the final say. And guess what? God loves you. And that final say will be glorious and beautiful. We will shine like the stars in the heavens. We will shine like the greatest, brightest, most beautiful things. So don't be fearful. What have you wanted to do? What have you been called to do, but you've been too afraid to do it? My friends, May the resurrection empower you, embolden you, enable you to do that which you were fearful of doing. Would you stand with me as we close our word of song?
church. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Would you extend your hands in the form of receiving the blessing? As John the Revelator writes, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give this to you, this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. And so the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. You are sent.